Well, it's been a while since we've had a face-to-face. -face. I know we've been meeting in webinars the last couple of years and in uh, field days and stuff like that, but it is good to see so many faces that I haven't seen in a couple of years. So do come in and sit down and get settled. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a number of topics um, at the request of MDA. First of all, we do need some new information for this new phosphorus management tool. I have put together, with the help of staff, some new aids. Uh, we, we work on them uh, together to try to have them pretty clear by the time they go out to the door to you. There is a need to transition, transition our client base from the PSI to the PMT, and I'll tell you what we agreed to do in conjunction with MDA's request. And I'll also talk to you about um, some, some software. So, um, essentially, I'm going to talk about the new and modified components. I'm going to talk about the learning aids for those new components, the process that we use and I suggest you use for providing both PSI and TSM, uh, PMT information for your clients for 2014 plan so that they know uh, what they may be facing in the future, and then a brief look at some new standalone software products that, that we were asked to work on. Okay. And I want to say, first of all, that soils data is foundational to all this, and in the last 15 years, there's been a revolution in terms of how uh, soils information was communicated to us as the users, and our CS uh, basically transformed from a hard copy web soil survey based on counties or several counties to something called web soil survey. And some of you may wonder why I'm talking about this now, but um, I know there's a number of private sector people that still use the old standalone PSI software that was released in 2001 and never updated. So I do believe there's people out there that are still using antiquated soil um, information, and I want to just briefly uh, emphasize the fact that there is new stuff and um, show you the aid we have to help you use it. All counties' soils information has been updated in the past 15 years, in some cases the past three or four years. Hard copies, uh, hard copy versions of uh, web soil, survey or soil surveys are now all out of date to some extent. In some cases, the changes have been massive and soils have been remapped and reclassified. In other cases, there's been some more subtle changes in nomenclature. But at any rate, the information you're getting off your hard copies is no longer consistent with the uh, information from, from NASIS or Web Soil Survey, which we have integrated into our software products. So Web Soil Survey is now the, the place to go for up-to-date soils information. Right. Uh, why? Well, we get our soil erodibility in there, um, our K-factor uh, that's needed for the uh, Russell. We also get our permeability class that's needed for runoff, and we get the drainage class and the hydrologic soil group that you need for subsurface drainage. So uh, soils information is essential to each of the three um, um, pathways. The soil, uh, the dominant soil map unit is what has been recommended to be used as the basis for soil information for a field for which you're doing either the PMT or the PSI. And in um, looking at and reviewing soils and, and information this year, I did come across one case where the soil map unit, the dominant soil map unit, actually didn't represent uh, the field accurately, and that is in a case where there were multiple soil types um, in the same field. Not the same map unit, but soil types. So this is an example of a Glenel loam. In one field, there was a Glenel uh, loam, um, I think it was 0 to 3%, that made up about 30% of the field. Uh, Glenel uh, loam, um, 3 to 5%, that made up another 30% of the field, and a matter that made up 40 well, if you look at this off the top, it looks like Manor is the dominant map unit, and while it is, Glenel loam is certainly the dominant soil type. And since uh, soil type is is uh, just a subset of soil series, it really makes a sense. It really makes a lot more sense to look at the Glenel rather than the Manor. And in this case, I would recommend using the Glenel uh, B, the Glenel with the greater slope, as the dominant map unit for your calculations. But in in most cases, it's going to be the dominant map unit. Um, and by the way, um, we always need documentation for how we made our choices and how we um, decided what information to put into software products and ultimately report to our client. And so uh, a copy of the map and what's called the map unit summary should be in your client's file for every field for which you're doing one of these uh, determinations. Um, Web Soil Survey is a very nice tool, but like most other software products, you have to know how to navigate around it. And so when we transformed to Web Soil Survey as a, as a way of getting dominant map units and soils information, we put together 
year sheet um, to make it um, make it very straightforward in terms of what steps and what keys and whatever one needed to use. And um, I have a copy of this both on my desk at work and, and on my desk at home because I only use it a couple times a month and I invariably forget the best and most efficient way to do it if I try to rely on memory. So if you're relatively new to Web Soil Survey, I recommend you print this off. There's a copy of this um, on, our, um, on our website. Um, Josh mentioned that one of the new things is the degree of phosphorus saturation. This is um, a replacing soil test as a much more accurate measurement of whether a soil is saturated with phosphorus or not. Um, and it essentially is the relationship between um, phosphorus and iron and aluminum as they are gotten out of the soil in an oxalate extraction. And I just want to tell you that looking at iron and aluminum in an oxalate extraction is an old tool that the soil genesis and morphology people have been using for a number of decades to um, characterize and quantify what they call, what we all call, amorphous oxides. Amorphous oxides being the very fine particles of iron and aluminum, and in some cases manganese in some regions, that are um, too small to be picked up by x-ray diffraction, but very high surface area, very reactive, very important absorption surfaces for things in the soil, particularly phosphorus. So essentially, um, along about 20 years ago, when the when the um, people in Western Europe, particularly Holland, uh, were running into problems with phosphorus um, pollution of their water, they they decided essentially to see if there was a discernible, understandable relationship between the oxalate phosphorus and the iron and aluminum phosphate. Um, phosphate. And um, in fact, they did find that there was a pretty strong relationship between the uh, ratio of phosphorus to iron and aluminum, and they related that with runoff and drainage water, and in fact, um, have, have a number of publications that have um, shown that to be an important predictor of whether or not your soil can hold more phosphorus, or whether or not that phosphorus is going to be um, subject to loss by either runoff or um, um, uh, leaching. So. Fortunately, there's also been some work done in this country where malic 3 is an important soil test e extract to see whether the malic 3 uh, ratio could be used to characterize the oxalate ratio, and sure enough, there is. And so uh, we essentially use the um, malic 3 iron, aluminum, and phosphorus transform back to an oxalate basis to come up with a degree of phosphorus saturation. Now, I'm showing you just for the, those that have a high need to know, just realize for the rest of you, it's in the software. Okay, if you put in um, phosphorus, iron, and aluminum, it will calculate this for you. And if your lab reports those things, they already have this calculation in, in their software. Right. I was concerned uh, when I knew that the um, PMT was on the planning horizon that people who had fairly recently taken new soil tests were going to uh, revolt if they knew they had to get new soil tests if they had high P soils and needed to get a PMT. Um, so I went to... to um, I went to information that I had access to, and I basically looked at the relationship between FIVP and phosphorus saturation ratio, or degree of phosphorus saturation, to see how strong that relationship was in some Maryland soils. And in fact, as you can see here from this graph, there's a pretty strong relationship. Where's my cursor? Fairly strong relationship here. It actually has an R square of almost 0.82. Uh, that's very good for real-world situations. Of course, there is some deviation. There's some above and below this predicted line, but it's a, it's a strong relationship, and after consulting with Royden Powell and people at MDA, they decided that until people get new soil tests, assuming they have some life left on the ones they have, they can um, estimate the degree of phosphorus saturation using this relationship um, if they choose. Um, so this, too, has been built into our software products. Uh, let me just show you a little bit. Um, our soils page has been radically updated to make um, to make room for this. Uh, we've dropped out all that micronutrient stuff that was pretty much unusable in the last decade anyway. There's now room for an estimated degree of phosphorus saturation if you choose that. You can input the lab's degree of phosphorus saturation if your lab reports that, or you can input the iron and um, aluminum if your lab reports that. Realize that these are mutually exclusive. If you input a lab degree of phosphorus saturation, the other um, input areas will be blocked out. You can only do one and not more than one. Um, 
there's been discussion of labs and how willing they are to provide the information we need. Um, I understand there were discussions at the regional soil test meetings that Maryland was going to need this, but when I started calling the labs last spring and saying, uh, you're going to offer it right, I got a lot of no's. And when I said, um, well, uh, are you going to charge? You know, if you charge more, can you offer it? I got a lot of yeses. So let me just say that if you use University of Delaware or AgroLab, um, um, they have traditionally reported that. Um, Spectrum, oops, Spectrum um, was in tune with what was going on via the regional soil test lab conversations, and they were more than willing to add it to their offerings at no extra charge. They're the only lab that decided to offer it at no extra charge. And Brookside actually uh, um, has traditionally offered the iron and aluminum that's extracted by uh, Malik 3. So um, again, that was one of the reasons why we built that option into our soil test page. Other labs will provide the information, but you have to request it, and it's for an additional charge. And to, um, for the most part, they are um, supplying the iron and aluminum information, not the degree of phosphorus saturation directly. Um, I did bring 100 copies of the updated soil test comparison sheet, and I know most of them have been taken, but that clearly lays out what you need to ask for from these other labs, um, and also what each of the labs that may already report it call this, because although it's called the degree of phosphorus saturation and the PMT, it isn't necessarily called that by all the labs. But if you get the soil test lab comparison, either the copy here or from our website, it will lay out um, how much the additional cost might be for the other labs you might choose and, and what to ask for. Uh, another thing that was significantly updated is the distance to water, and I'll call that D2W, as well as the buffers. They were kind of commingled before in PSI, and actually they were one of the parts that people had the hardest time actually understanding them. Um, they are separately and very clearly determined this time. There are three buffer choices. Um, and as you probably already know, the distance to water that is of interest for this tool has been expanded from 100 feet to 500 feet. And then after determining them separately, you combine them to get something called the DBF or distance to buffer factor. So the three buffer types are no buffer or less than 35 feet wide, greater than 35 feet wide, and a, a 50 foot or greater buffer that meets NRCS standards. And the distances to water are partitioned into five categories from less than 100 to greater than 500. Well, I was concerned with the fact that this greater distance might do several things. It might make it difficult to visually determine where water actually was if you're out there on certain landscapes. It also might put you on someone else's property that you have no permission to be on. And so it seemed to me that this was a good opportunity to see if there was a web-based way of actually determining distance to water and documenting that distance in a nice, clear way, short of uh, being charged with trespassing. So, um, and actually getting the, the information right. So uh, sure enough, uh, Google Earth has a very nice function for measuring distance. And uh, again, on our webpage, we have a, a tool, an aid called Measuring and Documenting Distance to Water. It shows you how to do it. It also shows you how to document it and transfer that information into uh, something you can print and put in your file. And again, this is information that you should have in the file for every field where you're doing um, a phosphorus uh, management tool. There's a lot of color in this because again, I have trouble finding things on a page, so circle them in red or put them in red boxes. And so it didn't make any sense to, uh, to do black and white copies to give to you. If you want this, I suggest you um, have it open um, on your browser or in your computer when you're using it. It's a multi-page document. I think it's eight or nine pages, but it's very, very clear. I like to say it's clear enough for me to use. And um, again, I don't, um, I'm going to use it a couple times a month, and I forget between, so um, they're, they're pretty clear. All right. um, so again, looking at um, uh, distance to water and buffer, there are these five choices here for the distance to water. There's the three vegetative buffer choices. It gives you the score for each one, and then it combines it into a distance buffer factor um, over there. So it's all nice and clear. There's a lot of calculations in the phosphorus management tool, but we've tried to make all the subparts and uh, components of it um, obvious on the software so that you can, in a very transparent way, see what each component of your score is. Something that's been, I'll call significantly updated also, is the application timing and method. We had one set of options in the, in the phosphorus site index. As Josh pointed out, we have different options for runoff now than we do 
for subsurface drainage. Um, so we need, there clearly is more information that we're going to need to collect than perhaps we've collected before from our clients. And um, in addition to knowing whether there's incorporation, we need to know how intensively that, that material has been incorporated and whether there's been soil mixing or not. So we really need to gear up our um, information gathering tools to make sure that we capture the information we need while we're sitting across the table from our client and so we don't have to go back and, and spend more time and bother them a second time uh, to get the information that we need. So for subsurface drainage, you know, that's in table three in the phosphorus uh, management tool publication. No phosphorus because maybe they just um, did, um, maybe people just went out and looked at what the score was without phosphorus. Uh, that's done by some of the private sector. Um, again, four options, but as you can see, they're not the same. Um, they're tailored to, um, is, the, is this a subsurface pathway or is this a runoff pathway? So just be sure when you talk to your clients that you have kind of a sense of what you need to find out from them uh, when you're um, chatting with them and getting your um, intake data. The one, two, and three over here uh, refer to the um, intensity of incorporation where, where one up here would essentially be injection, two would be conservation tillage, and three would be uh, conventional tillage. We came up with a new um, information uh, information gathering sheet for the phosphorus management tool, recognizing the fact that, um, first of all, um, I felt it was time to at least use uh, the Russell 1 built in Newman or Russell 2, and second of all, recognizing the fact that we uh, needed to indicate whether or not there was a buffer and how wide, and we needed some information on mineral incorporation methodology. So this is something we've had out for the use of our advisors, and um, you might um, want to use that or use something similar to that to, to capture and document the information that you collect uh, from your client. This too is um, on our website. And just to kind of capsulize again, uh, as, as Joss mentioned, there are three components to, to um, each of the three pathways. We have transport source and management for particulate, for runoff, and for subsurface drainage. Um, and the tables in uh, Newman Pro have been set up similarly. Uh, we've got our source uh, along the top, uh, excuse me, we have our transport across the top, we have our source across the middle, we have our management across the, the lowest tier. All the intermediate and, and final scores that go in are all here. So if you look at the calculations in the publication and you look at this, you'll be able to see what each component is. And then in the bottom right corner, you get the ultimate score for that um, transport pathway. Runoff, uh, again, very similar. You've got your transport across the top, your um, source along the center, your management down here. You might have manure and phosphorus, so you've got the management options for each intermediate uh, scores that go in um, and ultimately cut off the bottom here was the, the runoff score. Uh, same thing for the subsurface drainage, only um, ultimately um, you'll, uh, you'll get the final score on this page also. So the pages are set up similarly. All the intermediate calculations are shown. So if you want to know what each different com component of, of the equations in the publication indicated, it's, it's all here so that you can see it. Now let's talk just a minute about the score because um, I have a couple um, observations on here I want to at least share to you, share with you. The low score means that the phosphorus application cannot exceed um, the three-year um, removal. So theoretically, you can do um, an end-based plan with many materials and not exceed the three one year and not exceed the three-year removal. Um, in the second year, it becomes problematic. Um, we're actually going to have to be careful in our second year if you do a pretty high end-based rate. A pretty high preset or an end base rate the first year. There are some situations where you might run into a limit the second year in how much organic material you can apply, um, and certainly by the third year, we, you will. I've run through a lot of scenarios with different crops and different um, yields and different materials, and um, I will share with you that the, the first year of a preset rate or an end base rate typically doesn't run you into a problem with, with um, meeting the three year P removal rate, but it depends upon what you grow, depends upon what yield you get, and it depends upon your material. So we have to be very um, aware of what we're putting out. And I would imagine we're going to have to develop a tracking tool to keep track of this for some fields. A medium field, a uh, medium scoring field allows a P removal of the year of application, and that's all. Um, I think we all know that with some crops, some yields, some manures, that is a problem. Um, it may actually preclude the person from being able to use manure, a specific manure on a specific crop yield situation, just in, in what I'll call conventional agriculture. 
the population that's going to deal with um, the most problems with this, however, is our vegetable producers for whom removal isn't great to begin with. Um, and if they're using organic nutrient sources, they are going to run, they're going to hit the wall on pea removal pretty quickly. All right. Um, pea removals for different vegetable crops, even with um, published good yields, can be as low as 10 or 12 pounds of phosphate per year. And even for some that remove quite a bit, it may only be 24 to 30. So if they're using organic sources like compost, and they should be using a composted product, not a fresh product from a microbial contamination point of view, that are low in available nitrogen, um, this client uh, base is, um, is the one I believe is going to run into issues with limitations first. I also want to um, point out to you that you have to be careful about what I call circularity. If you all have a better term for that, let me know. But what I mean is you you put in a certain rate in the calculation uh, rate of organic material, and it gives you a score. But when you look at the consequences of the score, it's, it doesn't allow you to do what you put in. So you have to be careful of, of that. So essentially, you have to go back and put in a, a new rate that's within um, the limits of the, of the tool. So you might put in a, a preset rate, for example, um, that gives you a medium score, but it turns out that the phos phosphate is greater than the P removal. Well, you can't do that. Okay, you've got to go, you've got to back it off and take it down to the P removal rate. So be be aware of that, especially with situations um, where the, the um, crop removal um, is not great. One of the things we're we're doing in extension, and I believe we're going to ask you to do today, was to provide information to your clients um, for what they are, are regulated by this year, the Phosphorus Site Index, and for what they will be regulated by in the future, the Phosphorus Management Tool. So as, as we say, the PSI is the regulatory tool for 2014, but the PMT ne information needs to be provided in an instructional mode so that people figure out what they can do in the future. All right. So unfortunately, um, we, um, we built Newman 4 under the assumption that the PMT was going to replace the PSI. But we kind of hedged our bets by keeping the two products separate and not overriding three when we put out four. So we can patch up a system that allows us to generate both sets of information. All right, and, and here's the best way to do it. Open your Newman, um, Newman Pro 3, choose the conditions, crops, manure, et cetera, for your 2014 plan, and print the phosphorocyte indexes for the impacted fields and, and save the file. Then import that same file into Newman 4. All right. There are some new crop codes in Newman 4, so you might get some messages about, you know, there's crop 325 isn't here anymore, choose something else, so choose something else. Um, you may get messages to the effect that your soils have been renamed and you have to update your soils files. So th there's a few glitches in some counties and in some situations. But check your crop codes for accurate accuracy, update your soils, do whatever you need to do, and then print the rest of your output, your recommendations, your field information sheet, your phosphorus management tool output from Newman 4. Um, it takes a little bit of time. It's not an overwhelming time drain. Um, I've been doing a couple hundred of these, so I know. I mean, it does take a little bit of time, but it, it doesn't slow you down all that much. And then you, and the best thing to do, rather than expect someone to understand those outputs and be able to to uh, ferret the information out really accurately and quickly, is to complete a comparison table. So this is an example of a comparison table we put together for our extension staff. Um, the farm and fields that, that um, are, have a certain category in PSI in 2014 had an identical manure application rate, had an identical commercial fertilizer application rate. Um, what was their score using the PMT? Um, what was the manure application allowed? And what was the commercial fertilizer application allowed? This allows your clients to determine whether or not on certain fields they can continue to apply the fertilizer and or manure. Um, when the new tool affects them. Now, one thing I didn't put on is how many tons of manure that might be involved or how many pounds of fertilizer. Um, I deliberately um, excluded the, the tons of manure because in many situations, at least in our extension plans, we give uh, recommendations for far more fields than, than the clients have manure 
were to apply to, um, to allow them to have flexibility uh, depending upon weather conditions, soil conditions at the time of application. So looking at, at the tonnage of manure um, didn't really seem to me to be um, a, a reasonable thing. Why tell him he can only use 100 tons rather than 200 tons when he only has 25 tons to start with? You know. On the other hand, if you tell them what fields might be restricted or not restricted, they can um, take the next step uh, quite um, easily. But I do think it's important to transfer the information off those output sheets, which you as planners should know quite well, into something that's more easily understandable by our client base. Okay, and now a little bit about the Phosphor Site Index software story. Um, we released the Phosphor Site Index tool in, in April of 2001 um, and um, have not updated it since. Um, in 2000, later in 2001, we also released Newman MD, and um, our efforts after that were in rolling PSI into an improved Newman that had more crop codes, had a simplified Russell calculator, Russell 1 for those of you who went NRCS, not Russell 2. And so um, PSI was never updated. As the soil files evolved in the NASA's database, uh, we didn't put them in. We kept Newman Pro updated, but we didn't keep PSI updated. Nonetheless, I understand there are those out there that still use it. I have no idea how. It doesn't have the phosphorus source coefficient, doesn't have the new soils. I don't know how the hell you're managing it, but I understand you're still using it. And so we were asked to um, update the PSI so that people could provide that information expeditiously with an up-to-date soils version and all this year. So we have two standalone tools. We have a standalone PMT for those of you that have separate recommendation software. Um, and we have a standalone updated PSI. The standalone PMT looks very similar to the PMT I just showed you within Newman. The updated PSI has the current uh, soil files from NASA's. It has the phosphorus source coefficient, which has been part of the phosphorus uh, site index since 2005. And it also has a simplified Russell calculator within it. Now, let me just say, for those of you that use the Newman software, I'm going to encourage you to continue to use it and not move to the standalone uh, versions. If you use the standalone, it must be because you have separate software to do the recommendations, and that's great. I hope it's easier to read than what we have. However, um, there's a benefit to using the integrated software. You save on data input, and information is carried over from one part to the other, eliminating the opportunity for errors. Okay? Repeated input takes time. We all make mistakes. Anything we can do to cut down our input time and to make sure that information is, is um, transferred accurately and appropriately is going to help us all. So unless you're a user of the standalone products now, um, the standalone PSI, I recommend you use the integrated um, Newman 4. And for those of you that use the separate software, um, see me. We are going to have a webinar next week, and I'll, I'll give you some information uh, about that. I want to point out a couple places on our webpage. If, you're, um, if you haven't seen um, our new uh, webpage, we uh, look, went to a different um, um, system in April 1st. The whole college went to a different system, so our page looks very different. Uh, there are several things you're going to use quite frequently. One is the plan writing tools, uh, and the other, if you're um, updating um, our software when updates are released, it's going to be on the software page. So those two large uh, turquoise arrows point to the two things you're probably going to use most frequently. This is a uh, look at the plan writing tools page. It's actually dealt with as a handbook within our new system. And chapter six, as I'm pointing to right here, is the chapter that has all the information, all the tools I just showed you, finding dominant map units, distance to water, uh, comparison page. It's all in chapter six of the nutrient management plan writing tools. So please um, feel free to go there as needed uh, to get the things that, that might make your job a little bit easier. And with that, please uh, bookmark our new web page. Um, I, I believe we're still forwarding from the old one, but uh, this is the new one, and this is where all the information that we, we put out there to help not only our own planners, but the private sector planners will be um, posted. And uh, now I'd be glad to take um, any questions. question was related to the soil mixing. What is someone determining the adequate soil mixing? What is, what, what tool do you use to say you're getting soil mixing? I would imagine, um, well, I, I'm not an expert in all the equipment that's out there. I mean, I go to the field days just like you all do. Um, 
you know, some obviously stir stuff up and does some degree of incorporation. Other just puts things where it does. You know, like think of the airway that just rolls over and punches holes and things. There's no mixing. Think of um, a, a starter band. There's no mixing. Um, those are pretty clear to me in terms of not being examples of mixing. There's a lot of newer equipment out, and I think perhaps what would make sense to do is for you all at MDA and NRCS folks to maybe sit down and talk about brand names or uh, tillage groups of equipment that might um, constitute mixing versus no mixing, and in which case we could post it on your website or on ours so that people know. Those are terms used by Dr. McGrath, and if he's here, maybe he could elaborate well, on that. that would be my assumption. I assume in Dr. McGrath's work or somebody who would use that word, they had an interpretation of what that meant. So I think that's going to help us because the MDA does determine what tool is best for producing. I, I, again, I think NRCS and maybe Josh and you all ought to sit down and say, okay, what are the mixing, what are the non-mixing? I'll see if I can make that happen. Thank you, Howard. We appreciate that. And once it happens, let me know what you find out. Okay. So uh, the, the mixing is the reason it came up was manure injection. That's what we're thinking about. Almost any tillage mixes, except for a straight aerator, and that's identified in SFM7, right? It says a straight aerator doesn't count because there's no mixing. It's exactly as Trish described, common sense. It's the soil mixing, and the idea is the reason it's important is in subsurface transport only. And that's because of um, macropore flow. So you have enough mixing in an injection slot to break up those macropores. And the reason it came up was when we were messing with poultry litter injection, originally we had a straight coulter for the whole slot, like a planter, dropping poultry litter in that slot and closing and closing. That did not break the macropore, so we got mass flow through those big holes. We put a fluid coulter on the front of that deal, and that fluid coulter was just enough to break those macropores. So it's anything that mixes the soil at the bottom of the injection slot enough to break macrophage is how I would find specifically quick then you can plug into that kind of definition. The thought process and all the um, pages and fields for Newman Pro is if you haven't completed something and you don't have a, a green tab, it is not going to print. <laughs> So if you don't finish the field consultant page, it won't print anything. And if you're missing information on even one field, it won't print. So be sure that you provide all the information and that all your tabs, they're kind of like file folders.